For those of us who love vintage computing, many of us remember some of the more iconic programs of the 80s and 90s. For example, I have plenty of fond memories playing Doom and Duke Nukem 3D. I still remember seeing WordPerfect and Lotus 123 being at the forefront of business software. And of course, I still remember the magic moment the first time I beat Solitaire. That being said, one thing I wish I could forget was the constant fight for hard drive space. After all, every application I just listed needed its own bit of the C drive. One of my first computers was a hand-me-down compact desk pro with a very small hard disk, and it was a constant battle of either deleting programs, tempting fate with double space, or trying your luck with external storage. That being said, ever since my last video on Novell Netware, I've had a lingering question in my mind. For a modern vintage enthusiast, is it realistic that we could just ditch the hard disk entirely? Well, after finding this bit of code on the internet, I was inspired to find out. So, as usual, this is your host, End Commander, and today, some experimentation is required. I wouldn't be surprised if a large majority of folks do not recognize the program running on screen. It's Novell's Netware Ready Firmware for AMD Network Cards. That probably means nothing to the vast majority of folks, so let me break it down. If we look here at a picture of an actual AMD PC Net card, you might notice this large chip socket here. This is a spot for a special firmware chip called an Option ROM. Option ROMs are special programs designed to modify how a PC starts up. In this case, I was able to find a binary copy of the Option ROM for AMD PC Net cards, and with a little bit of effort, I was able to get it to load within Qume. Of course, I still need to explain what Netware Ready actually means. In short, it's a way to boot a computer without a floppy disk or a hard disk. For those familiar with modern networking, this might sound a lot like Pixie. Pixie, short for Preboot Execution Environment, is the modern way of starring a PC from a network. However, Pixie is a relatively recent development, having only been standardized in 1999. Before Pixie, we had RPL, or Remote Program Load. Ready Start is merely Novell's branding for the RPL protocol. While there are significant technical differences between Pixie and RPL, the largest is that RPL is capable of starting most variants of DAWs directly as well as OS2. To actually get started though, we need an RPL server of some sort. Quite a few networking solutions offer RPL and the splash screen seen in Ready Start shows a large list of early 90s network software that we could potentially use. However, given that Netware inspired this project, it seems more than fitting that we should use it. While we watch Netware install, it's a good opportunity to talk about how we're going to test this. In truth, I actually had the RPL firmware working some time ago, but I felt that just doing a test between two VMs really wouldn't be an indication of how well this would work in reality. That changed when I found this Kingston PCM CIA 10 megabit Ethernet card for my ThinkPad. This gives us an opportunity to both demonstrate our applications in a VM and how they'd also perform on a period correct network. This led to a rather crazy project of mine. Let's assemble a small office netware network, put all the essential apps on the netware server, and then really put it to the test. As seen in this diagram, we're building a four machine network. At the center, we have Odyssey 2 as our netware server. As we've seen before, we need a dedicated machine to do system administration. In this case, that's Discovery. Meanwhile, our client systems are Europa, which is a QM instance booting via RPL, and finally TMA1, which is our real-life ThinkPad 380D. I'll put the machine name in the corner of the video to help keep everything clear on screen. This gives us the advantage of both being able to experience ideal circumstances and get a real life idea of what this would be like. Let's get down and dirty with getting things installed. As with any netware installation, proper configuration begins with writing the rather extensive autoexec.ncf, which is what you now see on screen. I have uploaded an annotated version of this file for those who are interested. The link is in the description. The biggest takeaway from this, though, is the bind RPL lines, which tells Netware which interface we want to enable remote booting from. If we now boot our RPL machine, we now get a new message, netdos.sys not found. In the Netware system folder, we have this utility, dosgen. 
DOSGen reads a literal floppy disk and then creates the net DOS sys file in the current working directory. If we format a normal floppy disk as a DOS boot disk, switch to the login folder, and then run DOSGen, it succeeds. If we now reboot Europa, we can now see DOS loading over the network via RPL. This works because RPL is essentially faking a read-only floppy disk. Whatever is in NetOS is loaded up on our client machine. For example, if I create a test autoexec.bat and then rerun DOSGen, we can see that change after a reboot. Up to this point, I've been following the instructions in NetWare's DOS workstation manual, but I hit something of a stumbling block. The DOS workstation guide specifically states that you're supposed to DOSGen a workstation boot disk. What it doesn't tell you is how to make that. From the diagrams though, I can see some of the files that should be on the disk. What I inferred after some trial and error is I need to copy the core parts of the NetWare client, write net.config, and then set autoexec.bat and config.sys correctly. After more than a few failed attempts, I ended up with a floppy disk image that could successfully start DAWs and attach itself to Odyssey 2. I could even log in. I'd say I was home free, but I wasn't. After running DOSGen on my known working network boot disk, I had a rather unfortunate problem of the system hanging. A lot of experimentation showed that the moment that the PC net driver was loaded, the RPL firmware glitched out and reset the network card. The end result was that DOS would hang because Ready Start or its IPX driver was no longer available. I tried various fixes and went searching through the annals of Usenet to try and figure out what was going on. What I learned is that this type of crash appears to have been fairly common. The root cause appears to be due to the fact that the network client is modular in nature and that the network driver must be loaded before the IPX stack. This problem occurs in both NetWare's official drivers like their NE2000 driver and add-on drivers like the PCNet driver I was using. Various solutions such as installing an updated rboot and various server-side patches were tried with no avail. The most common solution was to simply use the older monolithic drivers from NetWare 2.0 which appeared to be immune to this problem. That would have been great if I had a driver from that era. Finally, I managed to find one post that had figured out a workaround. Create a RAM disk and then load the client from that. Most versions of DAWs ship with ramdrive.sys, a simple device driver that creates a blank RAM disk on startup. Furthermore, DAWs supports relocating command.com after startup by using the comspec environmental variable. After a lot of filling, I was able to come up with a set of batch files that create a RAM disk, copy the boot files to it, and then initializes the network successfully. As seen by the boot messages, Europa has now made first contact with Odyssey 2. For those who want to try us at home, the necessary batch scripts and instructions are linked in the description. The next step was to bring the Tycho Magnetic Anomaly up to speed with this plan. Unfortunately, despite my best efforts, I have yet to find a way to port or otherwise run an RPL boot ROM on this machine. Easy Setup does list network boot as an option, but it only supports a token ring adapter of some sort. That being said, a boot disk was entirely practical. As it turns out, all I needed to do was take the existing DOSGen disk and replace the PC net driver and we're good to go. Unfortunately, removing the hard disk from this ThinkPad is exceptionally difficult and not something I can easily do at this time. To simulate a diskless environment though, I decided to simply delete the DOS partition from the hard disk. Perhaps in the future, I'll do a follow-up of a proper diskless setup on real hardware, but for the moment, this is the best I can do. Switching back to our administration machine, let's do a bit of basic setup. The first thing we need to do is create a proper user and figure out how to lay everything out. Novell doesn't provide any hard and fast rules on how to set up users or networked applications. As I've shown before, the most Novell gives as far as guidance are these worksheets in the installation manual. The only truly necessary component is that the syspublic folder, which contains most of the network utilities, needs to be assigned to a drive letter. Beyond that, pretty much anything is fair game. That being said, there are some obvious considerations. As DAWs normally assigns drive letters starting from A and going downward, 
it makes sense for us to start at Z and make our way up. That reduces the possibility of any sort of collision. First, let's get the obvious out of the way and map syspublic to Z. The next bit is also fairly simple. We still need the rest of DAWs. We'll copy the DAWs 6.2 folder from Discovery and then map that folder read only to drive letter Y. We'll then dedicate drive letter X to holding our applications with each application being in a subdirectory. Furthermore, I decided that the user's home folder should be in L as it's roughly in the middle of the alphabet and it's unlikely to cause a drive letter collision. While DAWs itself has no concept of users or home directories, by using consistently mapped drive letters, we can set same defaults for applications and login scripts. With the planning out of the way, let's get DAWs and our login scripts sorted. During installation, I created dedicated volumes for data and users. Using Xcopy, I can simply copy the installed DAWs folder from Discovery in one single go. Likewise, our home folder is stored on user and commander. The login script then becomes extremely straightforward to write, and we now have a basic DAWs system ready to go on Europa. Of course, we still need some actual applications to go along with this. With all the setup work done, let's start with the work stuff first. And by work, I mean WordPerfect 5.1. WordPerfect is one of the few DAWs applications that has a specific network install option. Since DAWs is normally a single user operating system, it's not uncommon for applications to have issues due to faulty assumptions, something that we will see later in this video. Rather notably, after a network installation, WordPerfect's behavior also changes. After installation, running WP causes this new prompt for the user to type in a three letter username. This is a feature of WordPerfect for keeping user settings separate. It is, however, irrelevant with the way we have the L drive set up. That being said, as expected, WordPerfect performs flawlessly over the network. So let's give that the big old stamp of approval. Next up is Lotus 123 version 2.4. 123 was one of the biggest killer apps and remained a mainstay of businesses until Excel would eventually push it out of the marketplace entirely. Unlike WordPerfect, 123 does not have a network option. In fact, I had considerable issues getting 123 to work at all, with it constantly getting stuck with broken display settings. Even after I got that resolved, it would constantly complain about read-only drives. A lot of trial and error showed that Lotus's configuration is split into what it calls sets, and I eventually stumbled upon the right settings to move its working directory to the L drive. While 123 didn't make it easy, I do have to give it the it works stamp. Now, I could sit here and do business software all day, but let's try something a bit more interesting. Games usually have to read resources across the network to load levels, art, and music. As such, I'm expecting some more interesting catastrophic failures from this test. Let's start with the smash hit of 1993, Doom. Here, we start running into problems. I was able to install Doom just fine as supervisor, but I couldn't configure it properly. This is due to its folder being read-only. Changing the permissions to grant write access allowed setup to run just fine, and I was really impressed to see it running without issue on the ThinkPad over the network. That being said, there were some problems. On our emulated machine, Doom immediately hung. This doesn't appear to be a problem with the network or the fact that this is a diskless machine. In fact, it appears entirely due to broken sound emulation in QM 4.2. I guess it goes to show that BitRaw and emulators is real. There isn't much demand to run DAWs, so things like Sound Blaster support suffer. That being said, it really is to Netware's credit that this not only works, it's fully playable on a 10 megabit Ethernet connection. In that vein, I decided to try something a little more demanding, Duke Nukem 3D. Like Doom, I had to set its folder read-write, but it works too. I really have to give credit to Netware here. Its client is both performant and seamless enough that this works without issue. Now, I could sit here all day and continue trying various DAWs applications, and if you guys have any suggestions, I'd be happy to do a follow-up, but there is something specific I want to try. Microsoft Windows. Windows 3.1 was the last 16-bit version of Windows that could easily exit back to DAWs, and it could simply be launched as an application. 
While Windows 95 could be loaded via RPL, it required a rather involved process to do so. If you do want to see me do diskless Windows 95, leave a comment below. Getting back to Windows 3.1, getting diskless operation to work was a little bit of trial and error. The first step is to do what's known as an administrative install as supervisor. This launches Windows SEP as normal, but it just prompts for all six disks and never starts the graphical part of the installation. Instead, all the files are decompressed and installed to the xwin32 folder. The next step is to log in as the end commander user and run setup slash n, which does the network installation part. Once again, installation prompts for a folder, but unlike the administrative install, this is for a user's individual settings. This process looks similar to the normal graphical installation, but it doesn't prompt for any disks. In theory, I should simply be able to type win, but it errored out when I tried it, with the given error message being that my netware shell was too old. Some searching turned up an Archive TechNet article which outlined how to fix this. Afterwards, we can simply start Windows just fine. A closer examination with File Manager shows a small number of files in L, Win32 and the rest of the files on the X drive. At this point, I think we can conclude that yes, Windows 3.1 can in fact be run without a hard disk. And yes, it does run on real hardware. As we reach the end of this video, it's time to draw some conclusions. In general, NetWare has been both rock solid and fast. However, we've also seen a lot on why it's important to test things on real hardware. Besides the Doom sound issue, Cumis had relatively poor network performance and notable lag. I don't know if this is an artifact of emulation or a problem with the RPL firmware itself. I do hope to acquire hardware capable of doing native RPL booting in the near future, so I may come back to this topic in a future video. That's all the time we have here today, so as usual, if you liked this video, please like and subscribe, it really does make a huge difference for the channel. If you're interested in following my adventures in real time, feel free to follow me on Twitter or come join my Discord. Until the next time, this is End Commander, signing off. Bye bye.